Do you recognize these images? That's right, it's San Bruno, the city we call home. This is what it looks like now. With more modern homes in the hills and older homes by the railroad tracks, San Francisco International Airport down by the water, with planes flying overhead every few minutes. We have BART and Caltrain, as well as an extensive freeway system to get us where we want to go. San Bruno is part of the greater San Francisco metropolitan area. If you didn't know where the city boundaries lie, you might not know where San Bruno ends and Millbrae, Pacifica, or South San Francisco begin. San Bruno, the city with a heart home to approximately 43,000 people. If you ask anyone who lives in San Bruno a street name, like Genevin and Mastic, Cunningham, Mills, or Sneath, they are well-known streets, and you will get directions easily. El Camino Real is the main thoroughfare through the city and all the way down the peninsula. But if you ask who Genevin was, or what Mills did, or when did Cunningham live, you might not find the answer so easily. Most who live here don't know who these men were. In fact, the streets and their names tell some of the story of how San Bruno became the city that it is today. To bring the story of Ohlone people into the contemporary, to teach people on a regular basis that we're not just still here, but we're thriving. Most present-day San Bruno streets are named for white settlers who came to this area around 1850 and afterwards. The Spaniards came in the late 1760s and made their mark. But before the Europeans came, Native Americans lived here. Not a lot of documented information exists about the Native Americans who lived in this area prior to the Spanish arrival. The general term for Native people, um, indigenous people of um, San Francisco all the way down to Monterey is the term Ohlone. What it signifies is that there's linguistic ties between all of those groups. There's cultural similarities, there would be strong ties through marriage and religion, but there's also quite a lot of differences within that group of people. For an example, my family, we're Chochenyo Ohlone, so we're East Bay Ohlone. Chochenyo Ohlone is much like a sister to the Ramatush Ohlone language, which is the native language of San Francisco, all the way down the peninsula, so it passed through San Bruno to about Palo Alto. So the two languages would be so close that they're, they're um, mutually understandable, but there's also slight differences. So it would, I guess a good example would be different dialects of Italian. Well, there was a uh, community, and they were called the Yurubrubs, and they existed in the San Bruno and South San Francisco area at the time of the Spanish discovery of this area. And they were, in fact, um, among the first people uh, to be taken into the mission at San Francisco. In what is now known as the city limits of San Bruno, there are three campsites on record, one along the creek in present-day City Park and two others in Crestmore Canyon. It's quite possible that this area was used as a hunting grounds rather than an area where the Ohlone lived. Anthropologists in the early 1900s labeled the local natives as being primitive hunter-gatherers. More recent anthropological research suggests that not only were their cultures much more complex and diverse than earlier believed, but that the Ohlone and other natives had been living in the greater San Francisco Bay Area for as long as 15,000 years. They traded up and down the coast, mainly traveling by water. Anthropologists will say that native people have lived in this area for about 14 to 15,000 years. That's the general anthropological um, explanation for a very complex question, um, such as when did Ohlone people arrive? Um, because traditionally in our narratives, we began in this area. This is where our creation um, started. This is where, for us, our lives started. This is where our, our stories, our, our, our songs, our voices, our ability to speak for ourselves, all, the, all these things started from this place that we're in right now, from the Bay Area. 
And so it's hard for me as a modern Ohlone person to, to really discount and discredit those stories that are so embedded in our psyche because if it's possible to believe for some people that things started in a garden on the other side of the world, then it's not too far-fetched to think, hey, maybe the world did begin in Mount Diablo and people just decided to go to other places after that. People would live during the summer in these, these marshy areas where there's abundant tule, there's access to the bay, there's access to trails that are, that are centuries old. The tule is especially significant because tule is the traditional material of both um, our houses and our boats. And we would use this, these tule reeds, these six foot long reeds of grass that um, are water resistant, and we would build thatched houses out of them. Some of them as large as to hold 500 people. So there's incredible knowledge that has to be known to build these houses. In these houses, people would live during the summer months. After the rain started, you don't want to live in a damp house, so you would burn the house um, and you would move usually into an established winter village. So people really weren't, I don't like to use the word nomadic because people knew where they, where they were going. So they would go from village A to village B um, just based on the, the world around them and the, their, um, their seasonal change. The Bay Area, prior to contact with the Spanish, is one of the most densely populated areas in the entire Western Hemisphere. Here in the um, San Francisco area, the, the villages are smaller because of the water and because of the plant life and because the resources aren't as abundant as they would have been in the East Bay or the South Bay, closer to San Jose. But in San Francisco, villages are likely around 50 people per village. We know trade routes that would go all the way into Mexico, into central Mexico, all the way into the New Mexico and Arizona, Texas area. So people weren't these isolated, um, you know, people living without much knowledge of the outside world. People were very much aware of, of the happenings, the celebrations, I'm sure the gossip, you know, of, of uh, the world around them. The traditional Ohlone diet, it's, it's an incredibly rich, rich diet that's full of salmon, shellfish from the bay, clams and oysters and mussels. There's buckeye and different nuts that we pulverize in, in mortars and create different soups and breads and acorn. That's our staple of life. They hunted mostly small game, but also deer. And uh, we're, we're not farmers. However, their, the variety in their diets um, proved to be very healthy. It is believed that because the native peoples had such extensive trade routes, once European diseases like smallpox and measles were brought to the Caribbean and Central America in the 1500s, it spread throughout the continent. The estimate of one-third of the Native American population dying from these diseases is conservative. It is thought that there were as many as 20,000 Ohlone living in the Bay Area in the mid-1700s. However, anthropologists estimate that prior to the Spanish arrival to the Americas, the population here was much greater. Ohlone culture survived, Ohlone peoples survived, and we're thriving today in 2014. We know so much about who we are and where we come from and the connection to this land and our stories and our religion and our languages because of the fact that our ancestors who were here in Mission Dolores and Mission San Jose for us and my family, they refuse to give up their way of thinking. They refuse to give up their culture, they refused to give up their identity, and they fought very hard intentionally to keep that aspect of culture alive. None of the streets in San Bruno were named for the Native Americans who lived here. There weren't streets in this area when the Spaniards arrived in the late 1700s, other than one old trail that they soon named El Camino Real. 